We're going to have fun in this particular episode because we're talking about one of my favorite topics, and that is large vehicles. And today, we're going to talk about the largest non-limousine passenger vehicle that General Motors produced in the modern era. Is That is the 1974 to 76 Cadillac Fleetwood Brome. Now, in the 1970s, many cars were big. didn't even matter if you got an intermediate. They tended to be rather large as well. And offerings from Cadillac as well as Lincoln and Imperial at the time were all huge. In fact, the 1973 Imperial is actually the longest vehicle from a production standpoint that was not a limousine car. And it measured 235 0.3 inches in overall length. A portion of the Imperial's length was admittedly in the bumper guards that were added on for the 1973 model year, both front and rear, to help the car meet bumper impact standards. The 1972 was effectively the same vehicle, but was several inches shorter because it didn't have those large bumper guards. Over at Cadillac, however, the largest vehicle that was produced was the Fleetwood Brome from 1974 to 1976, each of which measured 233.7 inches in overall length every one of those years. And before the Seville was introduced for the 1976 model year, this would represent Cadillac's most expensive passenger sedan. It was also the longest. It rode atop a 133-inch wheelbase compared to a 131-inch wheelbase for all the other Cadillacs, the Calais and DeVille series. And it rode atop a much larger wheelbase, as an example, versus some other vehicles in General Motors lineups, like the Chevrolet Impala and Caprice, which rode atop a 121.5-inch wheelbase because, of course, if you paid less for a vehicle, that meant that it had to be shorter, at least until the 1976 Seville came around. So during this time period, pulling up in a Cadillac Fleetwood was one of the best ways to really impress your friends. And the car certainly had presence with that 233 plus inches in overall length, just about seven inches shy of 20 feet long. Absolutely enormous. In addition purely to its size, the Fleetwood also had some exterior styling cues that let people know that it was different from the Calais as well as the DeVille. Recall during this 1971 to 76 time period that if you bought a four-door Calais or DeVille, they all were hardtops. There were no pillared sedans during this time frame. And the coupes were also hardtops. But you notice here on this 1976 Fleetwood, that middle B pillar in between the front and rear glass. Now, interestingly, when this Fleetwood was introduced for the 1971 model year, Cadillac not only had that B pillar in the roof, but they also had a little panel in between the front and the rear door and I can't honestly tell you why they did that. It was allegedly because they wanted the Fleetwood to look more custom, and by having this funny strip in between the front and rear door, I guess they thought that that gave it a particular look. But by 1974, that little metal strip in between the two doors was gone. They just extended the front door a little bit more rearward, and it made a heck of a lot of sense. Of course, on the Fleetwood Bromes, you also got the vinyl roof, and those beautiful coach lamps, which you could get on other Cadillacs as well, but here they look especially elegant. Now, on the unfortunate side of things, one of the things that you got when you ordered the Fleetwood, which was shared with the DeVille as well as the Calais, is that actually for one of the first times, Cadillac didn't have vertical tail lamps on these 1976 models. You'll note here the individual is stepping on the brake pedal, and the tail lamps are horizontal, and integrated into an unfortunate bumper filler panel, which often cracked and degraded along with the bumper fillers just after the rear quarter panels. These are thankfully still intact on this particular vehicle. But you notice there's no tail lamps and no lamps at all in the rear vertical fins. They're just fins with reflectors in them. Now, in subsequent years, Cadillac would return to having the lamps in the fins in 1977 in particular. But for whatever reason, I guess they wanted to try something different. And in the 1976 model year, there were no lamps in the fins. And you also got those horrible fender extensions. However, you did get some cool doodads on the exterior of these vehicles. The first is that stand-up wreath and crest ornament that was as big as a Frisbee. And I think it's the largest Cadillac wreath and crest until the early 2000s Escalade, which had an even bigger one on the back of the vehicle. But here it's pretty large and it at least is stand-up, so it gives you a sense of 
where you're pointing the nose of this vehicle when you're sitting behind the wheel. You also notice those bumps at the edges of either fender. Those are the fiber optic lamp monitors that would alert the driver to whether or not the turn signal, regular headlamp, and bright lamp were working. There are also two fiber optic monitors included in the rear headliner that the driver could see through the rear view mirror, and that would tell him or her if the rear tail lights and turn signals were working. So you had a good sense if your systems were working on your Fleetwood, and those lamp monitors were also on other Cadillacs in these model years. You also noticed that the 75 and 6 Fleetwoods had rather large cornering lights there off to the side, which interestingly, if you had the optional Twilight Sentinel package, which turned your headlamps on and off automatically as well as delayed the turn off, if you turned the turn signal on and just left it as an example in the left position, while the headlamps were still on, that left cornering lamp would illuminate as well, and then it would turn off with the headlights. Same, obviously, with the right turn signal. But the cool thing about the cornering lights was really in 1974, and that's because this cornering light in 1974 actually had two bulbs in it. The 75 and 76 just had a single bulb. It's one of the few double bulber cornering lights that I know of in automotive history. Cadillac would actually introduce the cornering lights to the automotive world first in 1962 in this well-integrated form on the vehicles. And it became popular, obviously, with Cadillacs as well as other makes, and they all picked it up. But that's where it began. It all began with Cadillac. Another cool feature that you could get on these Fleetwoods as an option was an exterior thermometer. And you can see it was integrated into the driver's side outside rearview mirror here. And obviously, it would just take the temperature outside, and you'd have to look out the window to see what it was. It worked perfectly well, made great sense. And I think the cool thing about the thermometer was that it's actually illuminated at night. So you could read the temperature, whether it were day or night. Just a cool little integration of a thermometer into the mirror, as well as having some interesting lighting associated with it. Let's turn now to the interior and discuss some cool features of what I'll deem the least funky of the interiors on the 74 to 76 Fleetwoods, and that's the Brome Delegance interior. So this is kind of the mid-level trim. There was a standard Brome interior, the Delegance, and then the Talisman in these years. But this Brome, I think, really had the most sedate interior. It did have some button tufting here, and these seats do look especially inviting, but... They're relatively tame by the standards that were set by the Talisman and even the entry Fleetwood Brome interior in a particular model year, which I'm going to show you in a second. But take a look at this particular interior. And here's the same Delegance interior, but in a different color, more of a tan color here. Now take note of a few cool details in this interior. First is the carpet and the floor mats. Wow, is that ever a thick nap on that carpet? You don't see that anymore. And off to the right, you have a litter container, a supersized litter container that's integrated into the kick well that was removable. You could actually take that box out and empty it if you wanted. You also have this new for 1974 instrument panel that got rid of Cadillac's kind of driver-centric instrument panel for the 1971 to 73 model years. An overall tasteful, if unremarkable design and certainly unremarkable finishes. That is, of course, faux wood grain. By this point, Cadillac was not using real wood grain in their interiors. This interior did have a bank of warning lights above the speedometer to alert you of issues. There really were no gauges aside from the fuel gauge and the speedometer. Everything else was idiot light based. If you look at the door panel, you'll notice that there's a little reading light at the front edge of the door panel. That was unique to the Fleetwood Bromes that did not exist on the DeVille's or the Calais series, and so you got three reading lights up front, one in either door, and then the one that you see that's illuminated in the dash, kind of hanging in the dash there, but in between the center vents and the passenger side vent. That reading light, that particular one on the dash, would be present on the DeVilles and the Calais, as well as the Fleetwood Bromes, but the Fleetwood Brome got the extra two reading lights, so I guess they thought people were going to be reading a lot at night in their Fleetwood Brome, and they had to accommodate those individuals. Here's a close-up of the instrument panel near the driver's side, and I want to show a few things here. First, obviously, the automatic climate control, which has this thumb wheel control. Notice there's an economy setting by this point, which was a setting that basically did everything automatically, except it didn't kick the air conditioning compressor on. 
in any of the other settings, the air conditioning was on all the time unless it were below about 35 degrees outside. To the left of that is the headlamp switch that you'd pull out if you wanted to manually turn on the headlights, or you would move that one little tang there on the bottom of the headlamps. It says Sentinel down there, lights. The Sentinel would, as I mentioned, turn the lights on automatically for you. It would turn them off automatically after a preset delay. You could adjust the amount of delay by rotating that little tang there. And on the upper tang, it says auto dimming. That was the guidematic headlamp control. If you had the bright lights illuminated and you had the system on, it would keep the bright lights on until it sensed oncoming traffic and it would automatically dim your headlights. And you could adjust how sensitive the sensor was to light. It was kind of a cool feature, kind of gimmicky. I think it worked better back in a time frame when people were driving on country roads as opposed to expressways and busy thoroughfares because obviously there's almost always oncoming headlights in those instances. But on the country roads, it does kind of work, I'll say. You also obviously have cruise control in this vehicle, and there's a little shutoff for the vents. You can see that little black thing hanging there underneath the driver's side vent. That's to block off the airflow. And one thing that I think is especially unfortunate about these Cadillac interiors is that it's almost like in some cases they phoned in the execution. And notice these two very large exposed screws that's there so you can take off that lower panel, but they're pretty visible. They're not invisible. And I think that's just unfortunate in an interior for Cadillac Fleetwood, as an example. It was in all of the Cadillacs. They all had those exposed screws there, and that's a piece of hard plastic. So an unfortunate time in GM interiors from a material standpoint, but eh, that's the way that it was. Here's a close-up of the passenger side door panel. Notice you got a supersized ashtray. There's the power lock switch as well as the power window switch, that reading lamp I was talking about, and the switch for it. By the way, that reading lamp you could rotate. You could move it counterclockwise as well as clockwise to kind of focus the light in the right place. And, of course, you have the casket handle door pull there that swings out when you pull on it and some sort of fake wood grain design behind it. I don't know what that is supposed to represent, and I don't know that it looks all that cool, but it is certainly there. And here's one final look at the instrument panel. This particular vehicle has the tilt telescoping three-spoke wheel. This three-spoke wheel would be used even on the GMC motorhomes and later on some of the top-of-the-line Buicks. It was introduced in Cadillac, and I think it looks handsome. The shifter there, I will say one thing about it on these, and that is that the index pointer that says which gear you're in often doesn't line up with where you actually are. For whatever reason, it tends to get out of alignment, but thankfully it's easy to fix. You just take off that lower panel with those exposed screws, and there's an adjustment on the steering column that you can make to reset that index pointer's location. Let's turn now to the back of this 1974 Fleetwood Brome Delegance, and You'll notice that beautiful velour fabric is back here as well. And you'll also notice if you compare it to the 1975 Brown Delegants that that one has a cost-cutting feature associated with it. Notice the seat backs on this 74 model have that velour fuzz all the way up the seat back, including on that rear portion of the seat back. That was not true for 75. It's just a piece of hard plastic. So the bean counters were hard at work, even in Cadillacs top-of-the-line vehicles in these years. Now, the other thing that you'll notice is obviously you got a fold-down center armrest, no reading lights in the door panels, but you did get luxurious footrests. And they're folded out here. You could rotate those up to stow them. I don't really think they're all that comfortable, to be honest, but they were at least a feature that you could talk with your friends about and, I don't know, brag a little bit. Now, if we turn to the trunk, one of the great things about the Cadillacs of this era was the trunk size. And yes, many vehicles in the 70s had large trunks, but I think that these Cadillacs had some of the largest trunks that ever were produced. The Fords did, the Lincoln Continentals did, because they had a super deep well because the fuel tank was placed vertically behind the rear seat area. But these are super deep, super tall, uh, I think they're about 21, 22 cubic feet, just massive overall. And I will tell you, having owned a 72 sedan DeVille with a similarly sized trunk, uh, one time I had a pen that rolled out of my backpack and it rolled to the back edge of the trunk. I could not reach it standing outside the trunk in the rear trying to reach in or from the side of the trunk trying to reach in because the fins, the vertical fins that are part of the styling, 
allow for a very deep trunk on these, and I just could not get that pen. I had to climb in the trunk to retrieve it to get it out. And I also took friends to a golf course one time and had six golf bags in my 72 sedan DeVille. I think I could have easily fit another six golf bags. It was not even close to being full. That's how large these trunks are in the Fleetwoods as well as the DeVilles and the Calais series. I will also tell you, if you're looking to buy one of these, the trunks will tell you something about the vehicle and how it was stored. These cars were notorious for leaking water into the trunks, basically coming in through the rear window area because it rusts out. And once it does that, the water starts getting in the trunk, it starts getting on the package shelf, and then it starts running down the backside of the seats into the floor pan even sometimes in severe cases. So make sure that if you buy one of these vehicles, the trunk is not damp. It doesn't have signs of moisture or residue because it was very, very typical in these. And sometimes what would happen is the water would get into the trunk and then it would flow into the bottoms of the quarter panels and rot out the bottom of, of the quarter panels from the inside out as well. Not a great setup on these from GM. Now let's turn under hood and talk about the largest V8 that GM produced, at least in a production vehicle, and that is the Cadillac 500 cubic inch V8 that was standard in these vehicles in 1974 through 1976. Previously, when the Fleetwood was first introduced, at least this body style was first introduced in the 1971 model year, it was a 472 cubic inch V8 under hood. The 500 was only available in the Eldorados, but by this point, the 472 was dropped and the 500 was the standard engine across the Cadillac lineup. It made 210 horsepower in 1974, 190 in 1975, 190 in 1976. Although you could get optional Bendix fuel injection in some cases, it made 215 horsepower. And some people will say, well, it's about the torque. Well, it didn't really make all that much torque either. In 75 and 76, it made, I believe, 360 pound-feet, which isn't small, but isn't necessarily that large either. So unfortunately, the engine was very smooth, but it was just choked down with emissions. And 1975 being the first year for the catalytic converter, these engines do admittedly wheeze at the upper RPM ranges because those early pellet style catalytic converters were quite restrictive. But it is what it is, and I will say the engines are very, very smooth. You'll notice that this one does have a vacuum uh, brake booster power assist, which was true for the DeVille as well as the Cali and the Fleetwood series. Interestingly, if you got an Eldorado, you got a Hydro Boost setup in these years. I guess because for whatever reason, they didn't feel the engine made enough vacuum or didn't have the right pedal feel, maybe because of, in some cases, the rear disc brake setup on the Eldorados. I'm not quite sure, but the Eldorados did tend to have hydro boost setups, and then the rest of the Cadillac lineup had these vacuum boosted brakes. And Cadillac also had these four different braces on the inside of the hood, you can see there. I guess they're trying to get a little bit more structural rigidity. Oldsmobile certainly didn't do that because Oldsmobile had plastic wheelhouses. The Cadillac wheelhouses were metal, so you couldn't have the same approach on the Olds. You're not going to brace into uh, plastic. A couple of other things under hood here. This is a 1975 model that I'm showing, and it's the only year where Cadillac had the cold air induction. You can see that that air cleaner snorkel is taking in air from the front of the vehicle, but not only is it taking in the air from the front of the vehicle, it also has a silencer on the edge of the air cleaner. Why you need a silencer when the car is taking in air at the front of the vehicle, I'm not sure. But 75 was the only year with this setup. In 1974, you can see the setup here where there's not that snorkel that gets the cold air from the grill area. Instead, Kellogg's got like this piece of fiberboard divider where they're trying to, I think, get the cold air from the other side of the divider into the air cleaner, and you see the silencer as well. And then here's a 1976 engine that doesn't have the silencer, which makes sense to me. It probably was just wasted cost to have it. But for whatever reason, that's what Cadillac did in these years and how they engineered the air intake systems on this Cadillac 500 cubic inch V8. Now, before we close out, let me just talk about a few trims that were super funky in these Fleetwoods. The first is the Talisman, 
which was an interior option offered from 1974 to 1976 that gave you these super poofy seats that you see here cloaked in acres of velour. And you got this enormous center console, both front and rear in 1974, making your extremely huge automobile one that could only seat four people. And it, that would only be true for the 1974 model year. Cadillac would get rid of the super chunky rear console that you see here for 75 and 6. In 74, you could also get this in cloth or leather. Now, the leather is super rare. I haven't seen many vehicles with that, but it was available. So you could get a leather four-place Cadillac Fleetwood in 1974 only. That would be a pretty sweet vehicle to have. Now, the craziest and most god-awful interior that you could get was actually the standard interior in 1975 with this cloth. This is the factory seating that was standard in the car in 1975. How awful is that? I don't even know how to describe it, but that was what was standard. It just makes your eyes hurt, and I think it's even crazier than the Talisman, but this is what Cadillac offered as standard equipment in the 1975 Fleetwood. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this spotlight on General Motors' longest, we'll call it modern, non-limousine passenger vehicle, the 1974-76 to Cadillac Fleetwood. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.